Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, uh, we actually can't see you, but I've been told there, there are many of you. Uh, special welcome to Elena. Welcome back, in fact, since she is a member of the CUNY family. She was an international journalist in residence here in 2018 when I got to meet her. I think not in this classroom. It was it was classroom down the hall, but she sat in on my class, uh, which was cross-cultural journalism. And I know a lot of your people who were in that class, Elena, are, are on the call. So a special shout out to the returning members of the class of 2018. Uh, for those of you who, who do not know, there is a war going on in Ukraine. Russia has invaded. And one of, uh, one of the most amazing journalists that was covering the conflict was Elena, who is herself Russian and writes for the opposition newspaper Novaya Gazeta, which until recently was still able to publish. But, um, and it was already incredibly hard to access, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but now has stopped publishing in Russia. And hopefully soon, Elena will tell us uh, if it's about to be, be published again. We have a unique opportunity to have a sort of intimate conversation, as intimate as possible over Zoom. She was with us here in New York in my classroom last week. She's now in Montreal. Uh, she left Ukraine about a month ago, uh, but we're very lucky because we're gonna get a chance to hear her insights, uh, not just on what's happening on the ground there, but also a little bit what the media landscape looks like in, in Russia. And hopefully, since many of us are journalists, give us some insights on how she sees the difference in the way you know US US journalists cover some of these conflicts versus how how she has or, or the, the approach that her and her paper have taken. Um, so Elena, hi, welcome. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you so much. So, so happy to be here with you. I mean my first question for you as we started last week, how are you? You're a month out of a war that you covered not with you know a huge team, but basically by yourself uh, on the ground. Can you tell us a little bit how you're doing? Uh, well, I'm fine, better than I was. Um, I mean, when I was reporting on the field, I was totally fine. But when I left Ukraine, I had some issues with, you know, uh, night sleep and concentration and, you know, like quite usual post-war stuff uh, everybody has. Uh, so now it's getting better. It's still hard for me to a great like being fully active but uh, i think it, i'm going to be back like in a week or so are you willing to tell us what's keeping you up at night um it's not like something specific i had nightmares like war nightmares uh just some situations were playing in my head um yeah but nothing very specific and are you still paying attention to coverage are you watching what's happening? Yeah, of course, of course. I keep following my colleagues who are there. I was going to ask, yeah, who's what? How are you getting your news? Who are you cover? Who are you watching? Who are you reading? Uh, well, so I basically watch the independent media, who Russian media, who keep covering the war. And uh, for me, it's easy because I'm abroad right now, but. Uh, for Russians, it's not so easy because most of independent media are blocked right now in Russia, and uh, the one, uh, the few ones who are not blocked, they have stopped operating like nowhere. Uh, so basically, for Russian who doesn't have VPN, uh, it's almost impossible to get real information. Can you tell us then a bit, since you brought up the media landscape in Russia, a bit about your career, how you came to journalism, and how you found yourself working for, you know, the independent media, and, and really how that has changed in the last 20 years of your, of your career, or not changed? Well, it has been changing. I mean, I started to work as a journalist totally, fortunately. Uh, I just joined uh, local staff of uh, um, regional newspaper in Yaroslav when I was born. Um, basically because I needed to earn some money and I'm from poor family so I started to work very early like nine years old and I was mostly washing floors and in high school uh, there was an opportunity to get some pre-professional uh, courses uh, and one of them was uh, organized the local newspaper and they were promised and they promised us to pay for every published article so I decided it's a great opportunity to get some money uh, so I joined them and then 
probably in a year after fortunately I bought Nova Gazeta issue and opened it on Anna Politkovska article and I was totally ruined because I realized that I know nothing about my country and I know nothing about uh, journalism in general. Uh, so I decided that I want to join this newspaper and so I moved to Moscow, I entered to Moscow State University and when I appeared in the Nova's office and basically told them that I want to be with you guys so please take me as a trainee, so we did. Uh, and it was like 17 years, even 18 years ago and then uh, one year I worked as a trainee and then I became a staff member. Um, so for 17 years, I am a staff member of Nowhere. And uh, yeah, situation was changing these 17 years because uh, when I joined Nowhere, this was not very popular newspaper, at least in like professional circles. Uh, they all thought that we were quite crazy that we were too critical to the authorities uh, like why we cannot see how Russia prospers under Putin regime and how wonderful Putin is um, so yeah and uh, in 2014 many uh, in the first uh, Ukrainian war Donbas war and after annexation of Crimea uh, many independent media shut down by the owners because uh, they got some phones call from Kremlin and uh, very few media uh, existed uh, like nowhere was keep operating and some of ours and um, yeah and right now like uh, no independent media are operating in Russia freely like some of them keep operating but they are blocked in Russia so Russians basically can get access to them and many media are closed and many media stopped operating like nowhere uh, so basically right now all what Russians can get is just TV propaganda but I don't think I mean Russia has a lot of authoritarian tendencies but it's not exactly in the camp of a, of a pure authoritarian state or an authoritarian regime can you explain a little bit more in detail how the media is right it's not China it's not North Korea so how how is the media you, you mentioned a little bit that some of it is self-censoring that the owners of outlets uh, shut shut the outlets down but can, can you explain a little bit what that balance is between you know the state uh, shutting down free press and you know people sort of self self shutting down yeah um well it also was changing for these years uh but like recently before the war um, well most of medias in russia they have owners uh, nova gazeta doesn't have owner we all now own shares and we elect our chief editor our uh like editorial council like everyone and everybody uh, and what it gives us that it's very hard to, uh, in, you know, like, it's very hard to order us from, uh, like, Kremlin doesn't have anybody to call, basically. Like, uh, and, uh, but many in, uh, so-called independent media had owners. So it, uh, and they let them do some journalism uh, but basically after uh, they got phone calls like you shouldn't cover that you should cover this or uh, we're gonna uh, fire all the stuff and uh, hire a new one something like that so it was happening for many years in Russia. As well, uh, we have a Russian censorship agency called uh, Roskomnadzor. And we have a bunch of very crazy laws, uh, which, uh, which is technically, it's technically impossible to obey them. Like, uh, for example, uh, we have, um, 
uh, obligation to mark any, any person who were proclaimed as foreign agent uh, mm -hmm. by the state as foreign agent, basically with like the enemy of the state, foreign agent. Uh, but the list is changing so fast. So you never know when you write about somebody, you never know, is, it, uh, is he or she already a foreign agent? Uh, and uh, if you do it, uh, if you're not proclaiming them as a foreign agent, it's like kind of crime. So this um, Russian censorship agency, Roskomnadzor, sends you a warning. And after two warnings, you uh, can uh, lose your license. And without license, you cannot operate. So basically, it's what's happened with Nova Gazeta. They send us to warning one by another, and uh, they were ready. Or they were ready to took our license from us. Uh, so to prevent it, we stopped operating ourselves. Um, and are there personal risks to the journalists themselves? Yeah, sure. Uh, like. They basically try to kill journalists who they cannot uh, control. So in Nova Gazeta, so we had like six journalists killed. Four of them were killed in time I was working there. So um, yeah, it was hap it was, was happening. So and then you said that you told my class that doing journalism turned out to be easier and better paid than cleaning floors, but you know. It's quite a risk, quite a personal risk you've taken. Um, and right now you are you are going to remain outside of the country for a period. Can you sort of tell us why you would do this then? Well, uh, I really like my job. Uh, I mean, the process of it, I like to uh, go to new places, see new people, uh, understand something more about the world that I didn't understand before. And I like to write about stuff uh i mean i just like it and i also have a huge responsibility <sighs> like i mean i really um uh, respect my readers uh they have exceptional readers in nova gazeta they're very very different they live all around the country but they really they're so impressive and they were staying with us for so many years and they believed us. And now I feel very bad that I cannot keep providing information for them as I did for many years. Uh, so basically right now I'm looking for an opportunity to come back and to do exactly what I did before. Can you tell us a little bit about the circulation numbers of Novaya Gazeta? Mm -hmm. So we have three issues a week. And so our circulation a week is close to um, uh, 750,000 uh, uh, copies, I'm sorry. And um, on, the, on the website, we, before the war, we had between one and two million views per, uh, uh, per like a day. But when war started, we got between four and five million views per day. And do you think, what impact do you think the work has had? Well, uh, we were, we, uh, before the war, we were the only one uh, national uh, independent newspaper in Russia. And it's very important to have national newspaper, uh, like the real national newspaper. It's what unites people, create the common space for mm. discussing things. So there are many cases when our work uh, changed things. Um, like I had some of them in my career, um, but I don't know if it's logical to mention them all. It's like quite a list. Well, why don't we talk about the lead up to the, the invasion of Ukraine? What was, from what you could tell, I mean, I know you obviously you you work in an office where people are are, are able to get around the, you know, and they're, they're, they have access to, to independent media and, and your readers are people who are seeking out independent media. But can you give us a bit of a sense as to the Russian public? Was there, you know, was there really consensus or, apathy, unawareness, lack of interest? 
or enthusiasm you for mean the war, for the invasion and for what or, or for their or in their understanding of what what is happening well um i left russia first day of war so i have been there since and uh I don't have my own observation, but you know that all my friends and family and readers and people who are wrote about, they are against the war. So even our propaganda is like incredibly strong as it was never before. Mm -hmm. uh, people, there are still many people who are against the war. Um, we have, uh, our legislation has been changed. So basically, if you are openly speaking against the war, you can be arrested and prosecuted. As you saw with the protesters, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so what, 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 what routes, what sort of via, what avenues are there to, to oppose, for, for like the Russian populace to oppose the war or to express dissent? Well, people keep, doing protests although they were arrested and beaten like uh, people you know, keep going to protest and they spread information in social media that, although it's illegal in russia and most of social media are also blocked in russia since the war started like we don't have twitter and instagram anymore and facebook by the way also we don't have it um so but of course, there are people who are rooting for this war. And uh, my brilliant colleague, Shura Burtin, wrote a brilliant piece about it. Uh, he joined some sociologist team to, to uh, talk to the people who are for this war. Uh, and what he found out that basically people are so scared of their future that they are willing to uh, believe what the authority says. And the authority says that this war was necessary and we are protecting our people uh, in Ukraine against uh, some Nazis and fascists and all this stuff. So, so why don't you tell us then, since why don't we turn to Ukraine? What did you see? Well, uh, the first thing I saw, I saw the, uh, like, first I realized it was happening uh, when I saw it. It was in Warsaw on the bus station. Then I saw the line of buses full of men who are going back to Ukraine to protect their country from Russia. Uh, it was so impressive. I mean, like, line of buses. Uh, full of people and one guy who I was talking with he was like an international student in Europe and uh, when he heard that Porsche started he basically took like a few buses to go to Warsaw to take a final bus to uh, Ukraine and he was calling his mom and his mom wasn't like oh my gosh don't go stay away stay safe she was like Oh, you know, I have your key copy, so I put it under the rug so you can get it there. See you soon. Bye bye. Something like that. It was very impressive. So when I crossed the border, I saw um, many, many women with kids who are standing uh, in front of the border trying to go in opposite direction to Europe to safety. <sighs> And it was nine and it was cold and a thousand people were standing and it was really devastating. And when I basically walked 25 kilometers to get a car to uh, leave and uh, I sent my first reporting from the border and then I went to Odessa, which was about to being stormed uh, by Russian ships, but uh, there was actual storm on the sea, so ships couldn't get closer to the uh, to the seashore. Uh, although seashore was mined by the Odessa uh, people, uh, so my second story was from there, and then I uh, moved to Nikolaev or Nikolaev, as you pronounce. Uh, 
it was uh, under attack already it was half surrounded by russian troops uh, staying in like 20 25 kilometers out of city mm. so uh, and with were constant shellings and a lot of dead and wounded people uh, so this is my first, uh, and also I was uh, able to document uh, one pretty crazy war crime as Russian soldiers shoot a uh, small bus with teachers of a local orphanage. Uh, this bus had like red cross on it, nobody took, put attention on it, so I just basically shoot them and they killed three women. Um, and then I uh, went to Kherson. I was lucky to go uh, and, uh, on the territory which was under occupation. So I spent a few days in Kherson and I found out that people are disappe were disappearing there. Uh, they were kidnapped by Russian soldiers, uh, like journalists, activists, volunteers, people who participated in Donbass war, they, look, they were also looking for secret secure, uh, like uh, secret service people, but they all left Kherson by that moment. Uh, and these people were captured and uh, they keep them in some kind of secret prison and they found this secret prison. It was the former uh, isolator for like, investigative committee mm. um so well uh and i was reporting from there and then i left and then i also wanted to go to mariupol but uh, i wasn't able to do so uh, with various reasons and one of them was that my newspaper shut down already so and were you were you hoping to have any kind of impact with that coverage uh <coughs> I just wanted Russians to know what Putin and his troops are doing in Ukraine by their names, you know, like people are thinking, uh, people might think that uh, what uh, they've been told on TV is true, like that. Uh, there is no uh, shelling or bombing of civil objects. It's all about some military stuff and it's not a war against Ukrainians. It's a war against Nazi uh, battalions in Ukraine. It's all not true. So my goal was to let Russians know what was exactly happening in Ukraine. And actually it was the reason why i got so much help in ukraine from ukrainian people because they understood my goal and they wanted to do the same they want to talk to russians directly and that was their chance to you know uh, send some information to them so they didn't direct any of their anger against russia against you personally no in the in the U.S. and so, certain outlets keep referring to this as Putin's war. I mean, literally, they will say this is Putin's war. What are your thoughts on on it being called Putin's war? I think it's not correct. I mean, Putin basically the Putin the only one who started this war, but he's not the only one who's producing this war. I mean, many Russians are involved in this war. So, well, it's very uncomfortable to take responsibility for that. I believe it's the thing we should do. Uh, it's Russia's war against Ukraine. And so I think it's the right way to call it. But how do you, actually, it's funny. I heard, um, uh, I should have written down her name. It was an independent journalist this morning that was interviewed on BBC, or independent Russian journalist. And she said that all Russians, including herself, are complicit. Do you do you see it? Do you think in those terms? Do you see it that way? I feel like everybody is responsible. Even as Russians don't have, you know, it's, they don't have the same opportunities to uh, voice dissent or to affect change within their government. You still, where, where, how, how do you, where, where, where does that complicity start, or when did it start? Then, 
I mean, these are things I think about a lot also in, you know, I look at Syria, which I, which I study and, you know, even where things are completely under control, no free press and the, the price of dissent is so high, is, does, does that still absolve everybody of, of responsibility? Sure, of course, because Russians couldn't, they couldn't ignore that they don't have free press, they, they don't have, uh, I mean, they did have some free press, but just some, they, uh, their rights are taken away from them and they cannot uh, choose president anymore, they cannot really choose parliament anymore. That, uh, I mean, our country was a mess for a long time. And probably from abroad, it wasn't so noticeable, but if you're Russian and you live in your country, you can see it. And uh, instead of taking care of it, uh, we all the busy with other things. And uh, here's the result. I mean, it's not like Putin got insane uh, recently and attacked Ukraine. It was a long process which uh, has uh, which ended up like that. So, yeah. To go back to an earlier question, you said that you know you didn't know how things were playing in the Russian public because you've been gone since the start of the war. But Crimea, Georgia, Syria, these are all very long term and on you know in Russia, Syria quite ongoing intervention. Same with Crimea. So where did these even register with the Russian public? in any way well uh yes but not particularly i mean like we definitely not think about syria as its invasion because uh we knew that just uh at least there is like some kind of common impression that just uh few uh, uh, battalions are participating in Syria and they were uh, like the, the uh, Syrian authorities ask them to come so that's why it's okay like they just ask us for help so we're helping nothing nothing bad is in that and about Crimea yes yeah, the general understanding <coughs> is like they vote for being with us so what's wrong with that uh, well, about Crimea, like there is like kind of understanding what's ha what was really happening, but it's understanding between like quite young and informed, well-informed like Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, who are, I mean, they are not majority, obviously. And Georgia was such a short war, like five days, and everybody like, oh yeah, it was mass, just five days, nothing's bad. You see, it's. Uh, also, it was happening for a while. I mean, Russia stepped into some war conflict, so annexed territories. And Russians, instead of thinking what's happening by their name, they were like, oh, probably it's not so bad. Probably it's fine. We don't know everything. Um, uh, Putin knows best, something like that. So when you decide that Putin knows best, it ends up like that. So then, in that, so then, were there any failures of Russia's in the, or what mistakes then did Russia's independent media make? I mean, because we're, you know, we can let's put aside, you know, people who are busy with their lives, and of course, you know, if there's enough of a justification that you can turn away. But as an independent media that was focused on providing or trying to document what was going on can you do you see and, and granted it's a hostile environment to be to be operating in um but do you see any mistakes that the russian independent media made yeah, or, or sure. did the rest of the world or is there is there something that your colleagues abroad were there mistakes that that we made well i would say for us first uh, we definitely should uh, should have worked more I should have worked more. Uh, and we shouldn't listen, um, we shouldn't have listened uh, the, not this common sense thing. Like, cause we knew we were right. We, and we knew we were right about what Putin, who's Putin is and where it's all going. But then the majority of your colleagues 
constantly saying you oh you just have such a dark look on the things you should find some bright things in our reality you shouldn't concentrate on such uh, problems how do you know that you are right probably you're mistaken it influences you some way you keep doing your work but somehow you don't do it as intense as you can you know i mean at least i'm saying about myself uh so yeah uh and i believe uh we sh uh, the syria coverage is the one thing which really we didn't cover syria well we didn't cover Syria at all because uh, it was so hard for us to get Syrian visa, obviously, because Syrian regime knew who we are. And we tried multiple times, we failed, and we're like, okay, we tried, we failed, so what can we do? Uh, uh, we definitely should have found the way to do so. Um, and what do you think you have? you and your colleagues have learned from those mistakes in terms of now Ukraine and what and how long you will cover Ukraine, how you will cover Ukraine. I mean, uh, Novak was covering Ukraine since like the very first moment of war and we covered Ukraine before that. I mean, uh, before that we had the war on Donbass, so I was also the one who uh, was covering uh, Donbass war. Uh, so all 32 days uh, what we were able to operate since this war has started and since the new legislation appeared, uh, we were very intense. Uh, and we did some, also we did some political statement. For example, the first issue which was published after the war started was published in two languages, Russian and Ukrainian. And we said in the editorial column that we refused to see Ukrainians as our enemies and uh, we refused to feel that Ukrainian language is the language of the enemy. Um, and uh, yeah, it cost us <laughs> quite a lot. Um, but actually, one of my colleagues asked a good question. I, I wanted to ask you something similar that you know, and the same thing happens in any situation where there's a lot of control of information on the ground, but you can't hide casualties. So as, you know, do we have any real numbers as to how many Russian soldiers have died? And will that, uh, will that erode support for Putin? Or is, you know, or, or is the discourse so powerful and so well developed that there are Nazis next door and, you know, historically the Russians have stood up against fascists and this is just part of the same struggle. You know, what, what power can seeing the dead and, you know, in American coverage, the war casualties are not really covered. And that's part of, you know, sort of helps to some extent or enables, you know, the ability for Americans to check out of their own, their own, you know, overseas adventures. Um, how is this, do you know casualty numbers? Is it increasing by quite a lot? And will it change anything? I don't know the actual casualty numbers. I have a, like approximate casualty number from Ukrainian Minister of Defense, uh, like a, a approximate Russian casualty number. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, it, it's strange to to believe uh, Ukrainian Minister of Defense on that. It's even more strange to believe Russian Minister of Defense on that. So um, no, I don't know the actual numbers. Uh, so do the parents know? Do the parents, do family members know their children or their husbands are dying? Um, well, yes. Uh, our newspaper was covering a few funerals of people who died in Ukraine. Uh, but basically, uh, families are so scared that they prefer not to talk directly with press. And um, it was a question which got really deep into me. And the first Donbass war, because Russians were dying on that war too. 
and I was expecting the I don't know some kind of civil movement of mothers and wives who are against this war because mm -hmm. they're losing their loved ones. Um, and I finally got the family who were open to talk to me, even uh, on the previous war. Uh, authorities said that there was no Russian soldiers in Ukraine. So it, got, it was like a government secret. So I found the family who were open to talk to me. So the Haida family was a woman like my age, but she looked much older because she worked very hard. She lived in the village in the south of Russia. And she had a brother who was like her closest soul. Uh, and she loved him so much and he loved her so much. And he went to this war and died. And, you know, like there is a common perception that person should be like well educated to express their like thoughts and feelings it's not true so this woman wasn't educated at all but she was very honest with herself and she really articulated everything very well and she described me how he knew he died and how was everything happening and how he she tries to understand what's actually happening because they obviously couldn't tell her that he died in Ukraine. They invented some plots around it uh, and all this stuff. And she finally uh, explained me how she got peace with that. And it was really what really shocked me. She told me like, you know, I had brother I loved and I had uh, like my country I loved and brother is gone and I cannot uh, make him leave again. It's impossible. So the only one thing I have, it's my country. And I cannot blame my country because if I blame my country, I will have nothing to love anymore. That's profound. And I think that's a decision a lot of people make are making in, in Syria, for example, to some extent. Um, and is much more complicated and is much more in the gray, I think, than than we're used to, especially in American coverage, which right now um, is very in the very much in the black and white. You know, I think you told you said to my class the coverage was a little bit like as if you were trying to compete with Netflix. Yeah, it's true. Um, and what is lost and what do you think is lost when when you know coverage of war or conflict you know follows a kind of cinematic script like that <laughs> definitely lose the woman that you just told us about and that is yeah. one of the most profound things I mean, i've heard it, it lost like all the complicity like everything should be simple and bright and impressive and the, the, the bad thing that, about this kind of coverage is that they uses the images we already have inside us. They just push them like hard, you know, like, for example, child on the mother's grave, like we already have it inside us. So we just, uh, we, yeah, so we just look some triggers in reality, which will trigger uh, our inner like fears and understanding of war. Um, but it's not about telling what's really happening. Like it's very far from it. So basically what they lose, they lose complicity, they lose the voices of real people and uh, they lose many details which are necessary to understand what's happening. But it's a quite tricky question for me how to write about war because I don't know even for myself how to write about war. I do write about war but I don't think I do it right. So. Yeah, I saw on the poster or one of the materials they called your war correspondent, and I don't, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, I would never describe you that way, but you know, I, I, I've talked to a lot of people who have covered conflict, 
but a lot of us, I mean, I ended up somehow covering conflict, even though I don't consider myself, I, you know, I thought I was covering Syria and I was covering Syrian lives and their lives happened to at some point become impacted by conflict. Do you have any thoughts on that, on those, on a label like war correspondent? Do you call yourself that? No, I don't actually. I cover wars, but I also cover like crimes and social issues and human rights thing and like some stories from small towns and villages and I don't think that my work on the war is more important than this work I do in civil life. I, I don't even actually even divide it. It's like pretty the same. Yeah. I think that's actually a useful useful way to think about things. Before we open up, I get I think I get to ask you one more question, provided you don't take more than three minutes to answer it. But uh, you know, one of the things that you told my class was that you didn't really feel like you were changing anything. And I know um, for a lot of Syrians, especially people who became citizen journalists in the time when, when you know, the, you know, the more um, lauded foreign press couldn't come in, they believed that they, the work that they were doing could stop a war, could save lives. Even as, even, you know, I, I worked with a Syrian photographer whose work was published on the front pages of, of, the, of the New York Times, the most important places, and nothing changed. And, you know, there was, a, I mean, you know, that is, that is something you have to reckon with. And his sort of, the way he thought about things afterwards was that at least his work would, could maybe be used in 10, 20, 30 years times in war crimes trials as documentation. You mentioned, you just brought up human rights and you talked about how your work was also in many ways documenting things that happened. Do you take any consolation in that? Do you think it, about it like that, about you know the other ways that you, the other purposes your work could serve? Um, and generally your thought, because there's a lot of talk about Putin being a war criminal, um, especially, being, you know, coming from quarters that have probably also committed their own share of war crimes. Like, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on that? On the idea of your work serving not just journalistic purposes, potentially human rights and documentation and evidence purposes in war crimes trial and on your thoughts on the idea of war crimes trials or crimes against humanity trials is like the good news as the yeah. good, good outcome, yeah. I mean, I wish I would see the war criminal trial on this war. And I will be very happy if I will use some of my documenting, I think. Because, um, like, you know, uh, I know that Ukraine is doing the great work of documenting war crimes on its territory. Uh, but the problem is we don't, they are not able to do so, uh, I mean, they are able to do so, but they are not doing so on the territories which uh, are under occupation right now. Okay. So when I was in Kherson and they found out this story with like these people disappearing and they found uh, the place where they were kept and uh, I found out even the list of um, like captured people. I have 44 names on this list. And uh, when I got all this information, I, I was the first who got it. And uh, when I left, uh, when I published my article, I got like phone call from the prosecutor's office and I like, like how did you how were you able to collect this information you want to know and i'm like i did so and so such and such so we pretty we all probably should do the same to get this info mm -hmm. to get this data uh Elena, i could you know i could just talk to you forever but i am going to let other people ask the questions sure. i see um Somebody is asking, is there a news organization that is underground that people can access since every other news outlet is blocked? Not yet, but we are thinking to create one right now. Okay. And they can follow, I mean, Novaya, I know I'm slaughtering the pronunciation. Your, your newspaper has an English, so it has a, a, a English language social media as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so it can be accessed. Um, 
somebody wants to know, are you, oh, Karen, hi, Karen, are you still shooting photographs or only doing written stories? Uh, well, um, on this one, I were to take a group with me, so I did everything uh, by myself. Uh, I used my iPhone to do photos, so photos that were published are uh, done by me. They're not perfect, but it's the best I can do now, right now. And thanks to Karen, my teacher in uh, J school, who taught me how to do so. Yes, yeah, since we, wait, I'm going to ask you one more question. Since you are a member of the CUNY family, tell us how did CUNY impact your life, Elena, your journalism? Oh, so much. I learned so many things from CUNY. I mean, it, it's so different from my experience being a student in Russian J school in Moscow State University, because there it's more like theoretical approach and here it's very practical. So um, I really loved your class because you, I'm sorry, now you should hear that. Uh, I really loved your class because uh, it's like you uh, getting like the different angle, different perspective of looking on the things. And I really, uh, uh, so Karen, I already mentioned how she taught me how to uh, look and how to shoot photos. And well, I'm not perfect in that at all. Uh, it gives me so much freedom. So even when I'm alone, I can produce some photos from my newspaper. And I love my writing classes because while well, it's always in English, I learned so many things for my Russian writing at all. And of course, I should mention Diane and Deborah, who was my English tutors and they improved my English very much. Uh, and uh, it wasn't just about knowledges and skills I get. It was all about the atmosphere, like uh, it's very close to like uh, the atmosphere we have in Norway. It's like one big family of people who are supporting each other and who understand each other very well. So it was really a wonderful opportunity for me to stay in such an atmosphere uh, and to do things. Um, with people who believe uh, in the same things I believe for like a year. And I also didn't mention investigative class and data class, and it was wonderful. So yeah, I got everything I wanted. She was contractually obligated to say all that. <laughs> um, joking. Uh, my, oh, Maya from uh, Chicago, my co-fellow at Logan. Um, Maya wants to know, how can we support Elena and her work now? Mm, uh, sorry, can you repeat it? How can we support Elena and her work now? How can people still follow you? Oh, uh, well, um, I don't know. Uh, right now, I'm quite a strange period of my life. Uh, I'm going to go back to Russia in a few months. Before that, I want to finish uh, my book about how Russia became a fascist state. And I think it's important to understand that it's happened not at once, it was happening for like a while and both signs of, of it were present. So I think it's uh, important to work. So I want to finish it before we can put me in prison. And uh, when are gonna go back to Russia? And it depends on our authorities, like they can put me in prison for sure. Uh, uh, oh, then why go, but why go back, Elena, if you know you're most likely going to end up under arrest? Uh, well, uh, but prison is not the end of my life. I mean, they won't give me like a long term, I believe. It's not going to be longer than five years. And, uh, and is that time better spent? Well, sure, but it's not like I'm going to immigrate just because, you know, the risk of being imprisoned. Uh, I mean, for immigration, it should be more important reason, I believe, than just, oh my gosh, I don't want to go to prison. So um, since we kind of returned to the political a little bit, what do you see as the best case scenario for um, Russian media, and that also goes to one of our guest questions, like how do you think news and journalism outlets in Russia will be trusted again? I don't know if you, if it, were they ever trusted? Um, well, 
<coughs> we lost a lot of trust of uh, our readers in the 90s uh, when many media basically started to serve oligarchs instead of serving people. And then there was like a media uh, conspiracy for re-electing Yeltsin for a second term instead of electing communists. And people stopped uh, res stopped to respect media as they respected before. And that's why then Putin came and started to uh, get control over the independent media. Uh, nobody really cared. Uh, I mean, the majority of people because they didn't think that media can be independent because uh, our behavior basically. So uh, best case scenario. What is the best case scenario for Russia? There are people who say that nothing can happen until Putin dies. Uh, but I know you want to see him. I want to see him. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't want to see him dead. I want to see him uh, prosecuted. It would be great. Prosecuted. Um, yeah. But what is the? What do you think is the best case scenario for Russia? What are, any thoughts on the sanctions? Are the sanctions going to change anything? I know it meant your credit card got blocked. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. And sanctions, uh, sanctions looks like uh, Putin's dream came true because he always wanted to isolate Russia from the rest of the world, but it's quite hard to do so in such a global world. Uh -oh. She's very happy right now. And yeah, uh, like um, all you... of sanctions, all of sanctions were to put on Russia right now. Oh, all against Putin and against folks uh, around him, uh, but they like effective. I think Elena's collect is, or is my connection. I don't know. Oh, uh, connection is bad. I don't know. You kept cutting out, but yeah. But can you tell them? Do you think that NATO or the U.S. should confront Russia militarily? Do you think that everybody should support Ukraine confronting Russia militarily? What do you see as best case scenario? Not most ideal. Best case, like what? What? What is? What would you so, like to see happen? Base, best case scenario for Russia is to lose this war because nothing is so terrible uh, than you win the war, which was uh, such unjust as this one. Uh, so how to lose this war, uh, how possible to, to make Russia lose? I believe there are other people to answer this question because like, I am not military expert. Uh, obviously, Ukraine doesn't get all help they need. We ask uh, Europe and uh, United States close the sky, and which is quite important uh, for them. Um, but everybody is afraid that this, uh, if they do so, uh, the war can can get into the third uh, world war. So I'm not the one who answered this question, definitely. I don't. I, I think I might have cut you off. I don't know if you got a chance to finish. You were giving us the background on why news outlets in Russia have not been trusted. Do you think they can be trusted again? Is there hope for the media landscape? I believe so, yes. Sure, we should prove this how we our work, that we should be trusted, that we can be trusted. Elena, um... <laughs> I see a question. That, do you see that question in the chat? Maybe we can answer that one. I think maybe we can answer privately. Or do you want me to read that one out loud? Yeah, you can read it. What if we want to send you money? Can we do that? That one. Oh, send me money. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, sure. You can do so. <laughs> I don't really know how to do so, but you can try. Um, but uh, I cannot say I um, like how to do so. Uh, I have PayPal. Uh, it's called. Uh, I can type it in chat. Okay. So. 
And I mean, I, Maya is a, a great journalist in Chicago. I can put you in touch. The question, one more question for you. Do you think Putin's ambitions are wider than Ukraine's borders? I think they are. I think they are. Uh, but uh, it's quite hard to, um, it's quite hard to understand how wide he's, he has an ambitions. But uh, I believe we should listen to him and believe him when he said when he said in his speech that uh, like Soviet Union should be like reinvented. Probably is what he's actually thinking. He was very passionate in his speech before the war, and he was very emotional. So uh, basically, he uh, has the most dangerous motivation possible. He wants to stay in history. And if he believes that to get control over some of Ukrainian territory is enough for him to stay in history, probably he would stop. But I believe he doesn't feel so. And I feel that like this war for him, it's not the war uh, about Ukraine. It's a uh, war about, you know, NATO and uh, United States and Europe and, you know, some kind of. So he feels like he's opposing the whole world right now. And uh, he won't stop till he feels uh, he wins. Because if he wins, Um, so right, and right now he's losing, obviously. So it's quite a dangerous moment for everyone right now, because uh, nobody can predict his next step, and his next step might be a nuclear disaster. So let's hope it never gets to that. Oh, Elena, we're at the end, but I want to give you an opportunity to end on on maybe a different note. Do you see any? Any possibilities for hope? Sure. I mean, humanity survived so far, so why we won't survive a bit longer? Um, <laughs> it's a Russian kind of optimism. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag Russian optimism. Um, what? Where can we follow you? Where can we see what you're working on next? For I mean, I know, but if you want to tell people what you're going to be doing. And sure, sure. Uh, I'm still active on Facebook, so you can follow me there. And also I have Twitter and Instagram. Uh, so yeah, I will announce my work there. And um, probably uh, I will go to Ukraine again. We are discussing right now with uh, my editorial office. So if I go there again, uh, I will uh, put some posts on Facebook and uh, I will share some links uh, with my articles there. Wonderful. Um, so weird when you do this online, I guess, I guess that's it. It's 1.30 and we have a hard stop at 1.30. Um, thank you so much. It's always so nice. Thank to you see so you. much. Yeah, I was very happy to see you and talk to you. And thank you all for coming and participate oh, wait, oh there's a whole other chat thing oh hold on let me just make sure i was looking at the chat chat oh what's going on here oh okay oh there were two thank you elena okay i think we're good oh frida's here a bunch of your classmates a bunch of yeah the, like, i'm so happy here. to see them well in chat <laughs> Let's see um yes it is great to see all of you again um thank you elena and please stay safe and i guess you know i when you she told my class that at least when in prison she'll have a lot of time to read and she'll start a prison paper mm -hmm. thank you so much russian optimism it's so good to see you again